everyone, and welcome to the LCS Proving Grounds presented by Verizon. I am La Tigris, and I could not be more excited to be joined by these two fine gentlemen right here. We've got Invert and we've got Cubby. So great to have you. Invert, we have you here on the broadcast for once after working so much through this scene. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's just... I'm glad to be here, support North American talent and make sure uh, we get the best possible uh, coverage of the best academy and amateur teams uh, left in this Proving Grounds tournament. So looking forward to see how these teams perform and kind of show their best selves today uh, in the hopes of uh, making it to the grand finals. Yeah, and what a pleasure to be you know, have the Kings of Amateur No Org making it to a top three finish going up against 100 Thieves Academy who have a core, uh, their core of the rosters from their amateur lineup the year previous. So I think we're going to ha have a really exciting losers finals here and C9 awaits in the winners finals. We're just going to have to see who earns the rights to play them next. And we have both of you here because of your expertise in the scene, already getting some of that insight right off the bat. So I'm sure you are very excited about some of the business that we've got to take care of right here at the top of the show. Yesterday, changes were announced in the Academy and Amateur System for Summer. And while you can read all about it at lolesports.com, we've got the TLDR for you right here. Now, the changes mean more games, 36 for Academy teams, a return to the playoff bracket for Academy, hopefully some more participation in our amateur tournaments, as well as a unified rule set for those tournaments. We've also adapted the summer schedule so teams will have more time to practice, play, and generally perform at the level that we all love. And at the end of the day, we'll get to see tons of academy and amateur action all season long. Invert, you do have a very unique perspective on all of this. What are you looking at here? Yeah, as an academy coach, it's really great to see uh, academy playoffs show up uh, you know, resurface as this thing where it's really important. We're adding high pressure matches to the academy schedule. And as a result, we're giving academy teams uh, and academy players more chances to show themselves off in high pressure matches uh, instead of a, a four to six week break where, you know, teams had to be a little creative, a little more, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, different ways to practice in order to uh, perform properly at a tournament like Proving Ground. So now they have that those high pressure matches to prepare, and they also have the opportunity through the scheduling of the tier twos uh, to see if they need more high pressure matches or if more scrims and a higher amount of practice games uh, is more valuable to them. Uh, so really exciting to see how academy teams utilize that, as well as just the fact that we get high intensity playoffs for Academy again. That's really exciting. Yeah, the playoffs are always a lot of fun. And as you're saying, a great opportunity to find that balance between competitive games played and scrims and practice on the Academy side. Cubby, you are very close to the amateur side of things. What do these changes mean to you when you take a look at them? Yeah, I mean, huge props to Riot, honestly, with this. This inning on both fronts, not only for Academy, but amateur. I know talking with a lot of the Academy players, they kind of looked at amateur like, why are they playing 70 games? We're only playing nine. Uh, so it seems like a lot more balance here. And for amateur, a lot of the big uh, like complaints were the fact that tournaments were back to back. There wasn't a break time to scrim. If things like went down, you got in a slump, you really had to figure it out on stage. That's changed now with four tournaments and breaks in between. So I think it's going to really help the amateur teams develop as well. And as a whole, I think Proving Grounds has really proven to be a very fun tournament. I mean, we have an amateur team sitting here in top three. And so I think more of a balance between the two. Really good. And Invert, I want to put you on the spot here too as a coach for Dig Academy. Are we going to see you guys competing at the tier twos at all? Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, the high pressure matches, having more of them was super important and being able to do that now and be invested in those now, uh, have matches, more matches with stakes. I think, uh, you know, it's something it's something we're looking into. I ha I I can't say for certain. I don't want to put myself on the spot and say all we're right, going to be at right. every single tier <laughs> two. But I do know there is another Dig to Toss team that will be in every single tier two. That is Dig Mirage, uh, our third team, our amateur team. So be on the lookout for both next split. I think uh, both will be great, great uh, teams overall. 
We'll keep our eyes out. I mean, there were a lot of massive changes made at the start of the 2021 season, and it's great to see the iteration continue with a lot of positive reception on social media thus far with mm -hmm. those going into summer. We do still have a little bit of business to take care of here in spring, though. On Thursday, Cloud9 Academy locked their spot in our final tomorrow, and they await the victor of today's series between No Org and 100 Thieves Academy. 100 Thieves, speaking of which, we did see it yesterday. They had quite the back and fourth series going to game four against Evil Geniuses. And Cubby, I want to know your thoughts on all that we saw go down on the Rift. Uh, 100 Thieves Academy, they got their revenge against Evil Geniuses. Keep in mind, earlier in the tournament, EG 2 0 them with a dominant mid jungle performance from Contracts and JoJo Pion. Those two performed rather well yesterday, really tried to pressure that mid lane, but ultimately, 100 Thieves. They were giving a lot of credit over to their coach, Freeze, the fact that it looked like they had more solid mid-game. I like the Tristana coming out from Devante. It's the first time we've seen him play that this season. And that double marksman comp with Abram really seemed to be a nice bridge into the mid-game where late game they started to turn things around in their favor. And ultimately, Luger was the one that brought it home. I know we have the joke that Crawl Luger, he is the king. It's not really a joke anymore when he starts putting up performances like that. Yeah, and they're really catering to him with all the resources in draft too, right? You want to play the hyper carry vein into the Kaisa, go for it. You want to play the Jinx and get your team excited that they're going to the losers finals and potentially contesting for that grand final spot, go for that. And I think that kind of pivots really well into what we think about the rest of this team, right? Ken V was playing the solo AP champs, but tenacity and his performance was really something to behold, especially in comparison to last year where he was considered this hyper carry, this person that you really wanted to play through with his aggressive picks. Uh, the pivot this split has been really interesting to see. You know, he's playing Gragas into Renekton. He's picking up the Orn, even though the mechanics might not be the greatest for those champs, ironically. Uh, he's playing the Scion, and, and he's doing it to great effect when it comes to, to neutralizing these other great players, right? Uh, as we saw with Tony Top yesterday. So for me, the exciting thing is seeing greater flexibility in a rookie's play style like Tenacity's, where you're able to have him play the Aurelia like he always uh, has been able to, but also that he can pivot to ch champions like the the Gragas, the Scion, the Volibear, uh, the Aatrox, and do so uh, to great effect, punish uh, mistakes properly. And and I'm looking forward to seeing how that evolves today against someone who, who we consider a, a fairly aggressive top laner in their own right, so. You calling out the growth of tenacity today, Kangas and Joshi on the desk at the start of yesterday, made it that much more satisfying to really see that evolution pay off for them within that series. Because tenacity, of course, was a big player in that win against EG. But I mean, he has a formidable opponent today, as you both have alluded to, Invert. I believe you have some direct experience with No Orgs Viper. Yeah, I worked with Viper on FlyQuest LCS. He won Rookie of the Split during his time with us. Uh, and I saw the potential then, and I see that talent really shine through through the amateur circuit now. You see great laning stats, but I think the greatest growth that Viper has had in the amateur circuit is that he's much smarter with his aggression. He's much more mature. He understands how to push his lead and when to push his lead so that he doesn't get numbers advantage randomly, he doesn't get ganked by a TF fall, he doesn't get support moving into his lane and is surprised by that. So he wards for himself more often, he's able to to take the information and know how to push his limits properly. That's the exciting growth I like to see uh, in a player like Viper, where, where not only does he take the uh, experience he had in LCS and Academy and, and translate it to amateur, uh, but he's also able to bolster uh, his weaknesses and, and create new strengths as a result of, of him playing in the circuit. Yeah, I know from speaking with Viper and just talking with him about his experience uh, moving over to Amateur, he's really gained a lot of confidence with so many stage games and Viper being such an integral part of the success of Noorg. He feels like he's really back at the level where 
he could be vying for that LCS spot. And I know that he dropped to Darshan. I love C9's game plan in that series to really neutralize Viper. And I'm curious to see if Tenacity can do that today. Because, Inver, you were talking about the growth of this player. I know watching him on 100 Thieves Next, we had a running joke, which was he didn't know what weak side was. It, he didn't know it existed because he just won every lane. Moving up into Academy, he's really had to round out his skills. And he's done a great job of that, playing these new tank champions. And I... Really curious to see if they opt for Tenacity still going for those neutralizing picks today, or if they say, we're going to fight fire with fire. You get the Aurelia into something like Viper's Nar, and we're just going to let you try and take over the game. Like, we know Tenacity has the skills to do. Yeah, I think that's something that you have to consider is what we have seen from both of these players on this journey thus far and the experience against one another. Darshan very fully indexing into his experience against Viper in that previous match. But the tale of the top lane, we cannot talk about it without talking about the junglers that we have appearing in today's series. And Kenvi, and uh, these are two players who really seem to have hit their stride here in Proving Grounds. Yeah, and I actually feel like there's a bit of a story behind these two players, right? Because and uh, he was the jungler that the first year Hunter Thieves was in LCS. He sent them two worlds. He was a part of that roster. And now he's going up against the jungler that Hunter Thieves has heavily invested in. Kenvi was the jungler for Hunter Thieves. Next, they secured his contract, moved him up to Academy at the deadline so he didn't get sent to scouting grounds. And now Kenvi really seems like their main developmental piece with Tenacity, with Poom, that core from Hunter Next. It feels like the future of 100 Thieves, and Kenvi has proved that. I know that Contracts had a great tournament. The fact that he was able to overcome Contracts yesterday, a big step in the right direction for Kenvi. And today, he's going up against a jungler that, much like Viper, is vying for an LCS or High Academy slot. And also the former jungler that went to Worlds with 100 Thieves. So Kenvi has a little bit of, of precedent, prestige that he has to take down going up against Anta today. Yeah, and the big thing with Anda too is it kind of feels like Kenvi at his stage of development is where Anda was a couple of years ago, right? When he did an initially get traded to Hundred Thieves from uh, actually my team, FlyQuest Academy, when we, we had received <laughs> BDS. Um, but the thing about uh, Anda, which is so interesting, is Kenvi seems to be in that spot uh, from a couple of years back where he has the great mechanics, he has the ability to turn a game on his own. We saw it last year in Scouting Grounds with his Kindred, with Anda, it was his like Ezreal, his Nidalee, his Graves, uh, similar situation. So now it's just about, can can be match up to the experience, the couple years gap in experience where Anda knows how to work with his team such that he generates leads on his own through his team. With Kenvi, I, I, it was alluded to on the desk uh, uh, earlier this week that he waits for his team to get advantages on their own before utilizing them. I think that's going to be a stylistic difference and maybe experience difference that can turn the tides uh, for no org in this matchup. Well, let's talk a bit more about some of those laners that those junglers might decide to or not to play around. In the mid lane, we do have Demonte, who was looking a bit mortal in his meeting against Evil Geniuses yesterday. And he's facing off against Five Fire, a player who has, in fact, called Demonte something of a role model before. Yeah, and I know, Cubby, you in an interview talked to Five Fire about this, that when he models his play, when he thinks about who he idolizes, uh, DeMonte is one of the first names that crops up, right? He loves that roaming play style in which maybe you're not going to lane the best, but you will sacrifice a little to get a lot for your team and for that win condition in the side lane. So now we have two players, stylistic similarities, but you know, I think today DeMonte is not going to be too kind to his fan, too cordial uh, to his fan in that way, because he is playing to move into the LCS, you know? 100 Thieves announced that they have uh, Abadage now. That's three mid laners for two spots, you know? So Demonte is going to come in here. He's going to kind of renew himself, renew his reputation, and have this real chance to prove that he belongs on a professional organization uh, as an NA mid laner and as true NA talent. And, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how he, he takes that challenge today. Yeah, and uh, I, I like the fact that, Tigers, you brought up that Demonte looked moral yesterday because it really felt like EG going into that series, contracts and JoJo Pyun 
heavily invested in a tent, some chocolate, some graham crackers, some marshmallows, and really set up the campfire <laughs> mid lane and made it really difficult for Demonte to ever reach the point where it is Tanner time in that series. That said, Demonte, with his experience, he did a good job of bringing things back despite being put behind early. The rest of his team did a great job of helping out. Luger, just an incredible performance yesterday as well. Uh, as we said, helped him get across the finish line. But he has to step up today, and I'm really curious to see if Noorg and Five Fire, because we talked about the roaming style that Five Fire's really been sticking to throughout the season, but he's a rather versatile mid laner for being an amateur prospect, and I want to see if he maybe opts into the Silas, the Akali that they were playing against C9, and they, they really try and attack Demonte and put him behind again today, instead of playing towards Viper, which they've done historically. Yeah, we will be keeping all our eyes there because, I mean, Cubby, you bring up the point that DeMonte, he did face a bit of trouble in the mid lane. He, in fact, tweeted out the fact last night that he has never been ganked as much in his life as he was during that series <laughs> versus Evil Geniuses Academy. So this gave me an idea. I want us to have a little bit of fun. Uh, gentlemen, how about some friendly over-unders? We can start with let's say, an over-under on uh, the number of times that DeMonte is going to get ganked in this series. I'm going to say 10.5 times. Cubby, what do you think? Ooh, well, yesterday, I, I think that EG proved that this is something that even though they lost the series, they did have some success trying to put DeMonte behind. And I want to see if Noor can replicate that, uh, kind of teasing the point that I thought that it's a strategy that they could opt for with Five Fire. I think it's going to be an over. I really think that Big and Ando are going to put a heavy focus on setting DeMonte behind. He's really been opting for a lot of mage play uh, since he's moved to a, the Academy roster. And I think that it's something that if Noor want to continue need to take the aggressive picks like the Silas, like the Akali, maybe playing through mid, freeing up Five Fire to make roams on the map after they set Tamante behind. Could be a winning strategy for no work, so I'm going to go over. I went under, actually, so oh. I Ooh. think the okay. exact opposite. For me, it is true that, you know, ganks can come in all shapes and sizes, right? It's not just the jungler. The support can be involved, like you mentioned. Maybe top lane comes down for a little cheeky, cheeky uh, look or two. But for me, the important thing about this matchup compared to the matchup yesterday is that both teams historically do not play through their mid laners. At least in the EG series, Jojo Pune is in, was a huge focus for EG Academy, I do not see that same focus from no org, right? For me, the important thing is, is values and value in Big's lane going to be stable? Is Five Fire going to get at least movement opportunities? And then top lane is where I'm really looking at the firepower and the ability for them to, to create a win condition through ganks and through tower dives, for example. So I'm taking the under on this one. I also understand that it's a little bit more risky. Maybe I'm getting like two to one, three to one odds because the support could be involved, the AD can be involved, the, you know, Jinx Rocket out of nowhere or Camille E and out of nowhere through Fog uh, from the top laner. So who who knows? But I, I'm I'm feeling a little risky, a little frisky today. I'm gonna take the under. <laughs> the length of the series too you're maybe hoping it doesn't go the full five but Kobe <laughs> thinks it's going to be over and that's the key is trying to focusing on mid lane invert you think that the action is going to be elsewhere which actually brings me to the second one i want to bring to you over on no org side i mean viper is the center of a lot of their strategy so how many bands do you think are going to be directed towards him throughout this series we're going to put it at 6.5 over or under invert what say you i'm gonna say over actually on this one i think that viper has some champion pool discrepancies and some picks that maybe you can't just neutralize, right? I think the Riven, of course, is the classic, but he's really evolved to having some the shy style picks uh, in the top lane when it comes to adding the Vayne, adding the Callista. Uh, maybe these are things that 100 Thieves just want to get rid of because they don't see, they never practice against it potentially, or maybe they just want tenacity on a neutralizer, so they don't want to make top two volatile for their own purposes. So. I'm taking the over on this one. I think, you know, maybe there's a game where it doesn't happen because they think they plan something against it. Uh, but still, still, there's too many uh, unique niche picks 
uh, on the side of Viper that I, I feel pretty comfortable with the over. I'm with you, Invert, and I'm actually going to center this around the NAR pick quite a bit because it is Viper's most played champion throughout all of amateur in Newark's 78 games. He's played it 21 times to great success, has a 76% win rate, and 100 Thieves. Yesterday was the first time they let NAR through the draft in all of Proving Grounds against Tony Top. I think that they had a good game plan to try and neutralize that. I do not see them risking that against Newark, just given the fact that NAR has been so integral to their success. Also, if they want to keep on playing tanks, uh, Silas is something that Viper, it was the only uh, win that Noor got was when he was playing that Silas. He's played it to great success as well. Jace is a pick you have to be scared of too. I really think that they're going to give Tenacity a little bit of help when they try and neutralize that top side of Noor. I think it's going to be over for the band category. Yeah, I think you brought up a great point with the NAR, and I also think Jace is another one of those situations with Norg's blue side, where it's a flex pick as well, and it's uh, something that could potentially crop up as a blue band because it's very difficult to counterpick a Jace in a, in a safe way, right? To, in a way that neutralizes it, especially in the mid game. So I, I, I fully agree with you on that. So Demand's got a big champ pool that has been drawn a lot of attention in the banning phase in these games. Y'all think it's going to be over for that one. All right, we got one more, though. In the spirit of friendly competition, how many Drake and Baron Steels do you think there are going to be? We're going to put this one at 3.5. Oh. This is the fun one for me. And if anyone's watched any of Amateur, you know that we have this running joke. We play for content, and we also play for Jinx Rocket yeah. Steel. So I, I've got to go over for this one. We're going to have a <laughs> lot of fun with the steals. This isn't just smite, so we're going to have to see how many objectives are taken. But I'm going to go with, uh, we might get a little bit of Fiesta. I'm going for the over. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. I'm right there with you, Cubby. I'm going all in oh, on the content here today. I'm going to say over. I think it'll be quite a long series, a lot of neutral objectives uh, to be contested. And as a result, yeah, maybe there's a Jinx Rocket here and there. Maybe an Orianna Shockwave steals it. Maybe an Orn Auto Attack steals it. You know, that's that was an NA special on the international stage as well. So uh, for me, I think uh, definitely the over. I think as well, uh, just recognizing that teams at this level around neutral objectives uh, they're not as clean as they otherwise could be. They gamb you know, they can gamble a lot. They flip a lot, as as uh, people uh, can say. Uh, and I just think uh, they there's a lot of opportunities for steals that can happen. It's just going to naturally go towards uh, the the fun content route. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's scripted for today. Who knows? But <laughs> gonna take the over I like on it this one. <laughs> Life's too short to bet the under, you know? You, you yeah. gotta go for it. Except for that one time I did a little earlier, but... Uh... <laughs> Do it for the content, everyone. Do it for the content. We're going to keep you fellas honest about these over-unders as we go throughout the series, but we do want to get your honest opinions on one last thing. Predictions. Invert. Who is taking the series today? Is it 100 Thieves Academy or no org? I think experience wins out. I'm taking no org three to two. And again, for content purposes, you know, emotionally, my heart says no org because I want to see an amateur team in the finals. I would love to see the best amateur team wow. versus the best academy team and make sure that we get like a proper brawl about it. So uh, I think uh, the experience that we mentioned before of Viper and Anda can work out in their favor. I think they can show some good stuff. I think the key to 100 Thieves will be breaking apart that bot lane, uh, breaking apart value and bigs kind of stability. If they're able to do that, get them off the Senna TK, get them off simple stuff like the Kai'Sa Alley or Kai'Sa Rel, I think it can be a really, really good game, good series for 100 Thieves. It will be competitive. I do think it'll be a five-game series no matter what. Uh, but I'm going to give the edge to Noorg uh, because of content reasons, partially, like I mentioned before. But I do think the top side of Noorg uh, can contest very well against the top side of 100 Thieves. And I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm with you. I've got Noorg in a 3-2. I think the Kings of Amateur win this one and get their rematch against C9. And we're going to get the best team of Amateur going up against the best team of Academy to wrap this one up. All right, our analysts are hoping for the C9A versus no org rematch in the grand finals. Let's find out if that is the case. Handing it off to Mad Magical and Crumbs for the cast. 
Hello, hello, and welcome in to the Caster Desk. I am ready for some awesome League of Legends today. It's the Losers Finals Crumbs, and he's already looking at my jacket. I yeah. told you guys, you weren't ready for the suit today. We're going all wild. We're here for the content, damn it. I want that 3-2. I don't care who wins. I just want five games. I was not prepared, but you were prepared for an incredible show today. That is a lot of shine on you, my friend. And with these two teams, I think it's interesting to see that the way that 100 Thieves won yesterday was actually losing a lot of early games. EG failed to close out and their composition, their late game team fighting really came through at the very end. Similarly, no org really struggled against those mid game decisions for Cloud9. The compositions at Cloud9 Drafter were a little bit more team fight focused. So if they have adapted from their loss against Cloud9, I think they'll be much more prepared to deal with what 100 Thieves showed yesterday. But the thing is, so only a couple days turnaround to be able to kind of fix those mistakes and 100 Thieves have proven that they can punish those mistakes and they can win off of just that minor little late game mistake where you slipped up a little bit about around an inhibitor took a fight you shouldn't have taken and then boom they run it right down and they're able to win the game which could happen here there's always that possibility for 100 Thieves especially when we look at the pick and bans right now because we're having that double marksman comp that's taken away from 100 Thieves not going to be able to put the Monte back onto that Tristana but I'm also seeing that Renekton taken away from Viper not yet the Nar. Yeah, not yet the NAR, but that's because I think on red side, Tenacity will have plenty of champions that will be able to deal with the laning phase and just neutralize the crazy split pushing power that you can develop from some of these unique picks that Viper can play on blue side. He's not going to be as flexible and you still have champions like the Scion, like the Malphite that you can just even the Volibear that he's shown mm -hmm. that will be able to hold their own in the lane, survive early dives or even just dilute them in the first place and you can even go with a thing like a Gragas that can also be flexed into the bottom lane but I want to now draw your eyes to the fact that the Hecarim and Udyr is going to be yep. traded now and that champion had 100% win rate in the No Org series. Yeah Hecarim was uh, a little bit powerful when we last got to witness that with No Org playing against that unfortunately but here it is that Nar? I'm, I'm a bit surprised. You kind of had gotten me convinced that we weren't going to see an R ban until, it, like, maybe the second rotation of them. Just be like, oh, there's too many blind picks. You're right. That's what they could go for. But they just didn't want to have Viper lock that in immediately, not even care if it's going to go into something that can get countered. But now, as you mentioned, the traded junglers. Udyr, I'm imagining it's going to be Hecarim. But I want to see what else is going to be taken here from 100 Thieves. If maybe they're going to try to hold on. They played Braum in games three and four yesterday. They held on to that until the very end just to make sure they could build a comp around having this hyperscaling jinx. Ooh, okay. Well, speaking of being able to focus the bottom lane, combine that with safety and whether it was a Braum, we get the Tom Kench center right away. So... Not so much about team fighting yet. The Hecarim is still available, but it's saying that we're going to make sure that the bottom lane gets to the position that we need it to be because Luger has been so important for them. If he is able to start getting some stacks on the Senna, get to a place where he not only has the range, but the peel from the support, we've seen what he can do when left to his own devices. And against a champion like Udyr, not really the best at taking this champ down. So the bot lane will be answered with Averis, but Viper is already taking cues from the LP finals locking in the blind jace tempting tenacity bring over the aurelia are you really going to play this there are the option is there you have a very safe bot side with the tom kench and center that can be left alone and doesn't need a lot of attention but it's the risk of do you actually have the practice and are you willing to play top side to answer this jace pick plus that means you'd also have to forego getting this hecarim pick that would of course, get banned in the next rotation if you didn't take it. So they have to flip the coin, hope that no org are going to say, oh, you know what, we'll, we'll dare Tenacity to actually take that Aurelia into the Jace matchup. Will he actually have the confidence to try to play against Viper on this Jace? Or still, like, we don't see this often anymore. But there is always that potential that Jace can be flexed. Fire likes to play a lot of these melee mid laners that Jace kind of fills a similar role to that. And being able to grab something that's a bit unorthodox, a bit unusual, could be something to catch 100 Thieves off guard. Even if they do flex the Jace, you've already seen that Noorg is committing to a poke style composition. With the Varus yes. and the Jace, whether it is attack speed or poke, Ferris, he'll still be able to dish out the same damage from far. Combined with the Jays, you're going to be able to play this out in that fashion. So you're dealing with 
team fight in a very different fashion, keeping your distance. Five Fire loves the Zoe. It can pair really well with the Jace here. You can blind it as a mid laner here. So I think that's where No Org is going here. They're going to give some agency to Five Fire. Demonte had a weak laning phase a few games yesterday. So it would make sense to put him in a position to succeed and have early game priority because the combination of Zoe and Udyr is really deadly as well as just a plain 2v2, which was an area that 100 Thieves struggled with yesterday. That it is. It's Karma is going to be the final ban coming in from 100 Thieves. Again, taking away some of that poke, that siege composition that you were just talking about. Being able to pair that up with a far spot lane doesn't matter if you're sending Tom Kench. You're going to get whittled down too fast and not really be able to survive that lane. So not having that prowess now means that 100 Thieves have a little bit more liberties to be able to try to see if they can at least thwart some of that poke from fully happening. And I want to see if it's going to be them grabbing that Aurelia here to make sure that they can really dominate topside, but they instead go for Victor purely to be able to get that wave clear. I think no org does not think they're going to play it. The Malphite ban tells me this is the Jace top. Malphite will be fine into Jace. Just queue him out. Level 6, he's fodder, complete fodder mm -hmm. with a Hecarim on your team. So this tells me it's definitely the Jace top, and we're not worried yep. about Tenacity picking a carry. The composition will allow it. He can definitely pull it off here. It's again a matter of is it prepared? Is the confidence there, especially in a game one? Because you bust that out, it doesn't go very well, then suddenly you kind of just took a whole game on your shoulders with that carry pick, and if you don't deliver, chances are you're gonna get that again in the same series is unlikely. It's been a while since we've actually seen Thresh be picked. He's been banned for quite a lot of season 11, but now he's actually been let through a lot more often. We've been seeing the rise of, you know, Alistair Rell meta that was dominating for so long, Tom Kench coming back in. So Big put onto something that is gonna be a bit more of that playmaking support, trying to be able to catch someone out of position and make sure that they can get that Devour coming in from Tom Kench immediately from these fights, because you can still follow it up if you land onto Tom Kench, especially to be able to take him back in. And this Rise pick is going to be really useful against the melee champions that you're already seeing on the side of 100 Thieves Academy. The Hecarim obviously doesn't want to get hit by the Rise Root, but the Aurelia is also really dangerous here. Even if you get fed on the Aurelia, you would not have been able to deal with the Rise, even if you had a struggling laning phase. So I think No Work did a good job in protecting the Jays from being countered that way, and they're just going to go up against full-on teamfight. It's what we anticipated from 100 Thieves. They were going to be able to play just five man group take those team fights and you have a lot of healing here between the senna the healing of the tanks in the front line and the victor in the back line i need to see no org be able to not only get advantages in the laning phase but be really creative with the realm warps to move across the map and catch out these members if they want to avoid the 5v5s of 100 thieves yeah, this composition is reminding me a lot of what Cloud9 had done to know or just the other day with drafting things that were going to be able to keep the fights going way longer than they have any right to be because you're not going to be able to hit them hard enough. You're not going to be able to hit them fast enough. Even if you have the poke from Jace, poke from Varse, they're going to just heal up right afterwards. They're going to be relatively safe if you can't kill them immediately. Yeah, and that's why those early leads are really important. So you do have the item advantage to deal with these tanks before they get to that unkillable state. I'm looking out, again, it's the mid 2v2. Namante was complaining about how much he got ganked yesterday. Well, this combination is no slouch in ganking mid lane. Either flash root or flash stun, the combo and burst is enough to take you down as a victor without cleanse. So I think that Five Fire and Anda will want to strike this lane. It yielded positive results for EG yesterday. I think they can do the same here today. As do I. We've loaded up for game one. Losers finals for the Proving Grounds presented by Verizon Wireless. This is going to be exciting to see who will be able to join Cloud9 Academy in the grand finals. Of course, it is a best of five. You want to make sure that you can shake off any nerves going into this. There's a lot riding on this entire series. There really is, and that's why I think you always fall back to safer compositions when that pressure is so high. You look across the world, all the finals that have happened before this, rarely do players are actually selecting carries in the top side unless they have the utmost confidence. The whole strategy revolves around top side, and it's something that they have done throughout most of the split. Yes, a lot of these teams have been playing carries in the top side, but wait a minute before we go back to that. These two Valiant know of each other's it. presence. They're just keeping themselves just out of range. I think Value actually was able to get around that. Oh, okay, using the red. Going to be spotted out now. Nice play on top of both Luger and Poom to be able to get a bit of damage coming in from Value. Big stand right in front of him so they can continue to harass Poom. I like this target selection. Trying to get 
Puma as low as possible. That way, it's a lot less likely that if a good death sentence does connect onto Luger, that you want to stick around for very long. And, and as long as this target selection continues to be really aggressive, I think they'll be fine against this lane. It's just that the longer that you take in between these trades against the Senatam Kench, the better it gets for them. They're going to continue to heal. And you see that Luger positions behind Poom so as to try to get not just a Q into the enemy, but to heal his own support. Here we go, though. Battling yep. for level three. Seems like no org is about to get it as Big has access to the wave, has chunked out Poom, and they'll be able to push this wave and make Luger and Poom retreat and respect the level two. Forcing a lot of mana out of Luger early on. Kind of expected, though. The Varus Thresh lane into Sanatom Kench. Sanatom Kench wants to play the sweet side. They want to kind of just be able to absorb a bit of pressure for the team. So that way, later on, they can maybe ha call down Ken V, be able to catch off guard value big. They're overextended just a little too much. And that's going to be a first gank from Kenvy here. There's no wards here. This could really pay off. What did I say? I said that if they were overextended a bit too far, this is what Kenvy can do to punish. Big has to flash away, still gets knocked back. Want to be able to follow up. Not going to be able to get the root. Instead, Value was able to chase away Kenvy. Just his presence alone. They don't know where Anda is, so they want to play this one so hesitantly. This is the next question. What will Anda do with the information of Kenvy's route? He finds him. Kenvy will be fine, but with Big and Valley having already crashed away, they can't successfully Hook deny Kenvy. Oh, he got hooked! Goes over the flay, charge back from Kenvy, getting a lot of damage. Big, he's rooted, he's in place. Gets the heal and the shields just to be able to survive long enough to throw it away 100 Thieves Academy, but they're gonna be able to secure this Scuttle Crab bot side. That was a really clever charge from Kenvy. He would have been very dead if he didn't actually charge into Big and reposition himself away from Anda. So a good heads up play out of him to get out of a tricky situation, but he's still gonna lose his camps. That was the cost right. of the gank into the bottom lane, but because his own support base, I think that Puma and Luger have actually done a good job in backing off and, and protecting his own jungler. So it's only gonna be the crabs and a bit of a slower reset for Kenvy, but overall I think no or can be pretty happy with how this has happened because now they know exactly, exactly where the Hecarim wants to path and Anda has a big lead early. Look at this. Double scuttle going straight to the Krugs. Even if it's not the blue buff necessarily for Anda, he's still going to have all this tempo lead over Hecarim. Already has a level discrepancy between the two just because they were able to delay Kenby from taking any camps on the bottom side of the map for so long that now Anda gets these Krugs. He's even in a good position to maybe punish Tenacity, who has a very low mana bar. Yeah, he's very healthy. I think that diving Gragas has been something that has often resulted in creating <laughs> one true. for one across the globe. Just a single body slam is all you need to stop that. I like that he doesn't waste much time here. I think the opportunity to steal the Raptor camp could have been open for him, but if you see how mid lane has played out, despite the Monte having no mana, Five Fire got shoved back in. So what, while it would have been nice to deny another camp from the Hecarim and restrict his options further without the team being able to back you up, you're just wasting your own time. He gets more value out of resetting, getting his early Lucidity boots, and trying to get ahead of Hecarim that way because he doesn't have those boots just yet. So he's going to take a little bit longer to start clearing across his own jungle. And as we can see across the map, some good freezes coming in from opposite sides of the lane. Tassie's got the lane frozen in a pretty good spot right now. Like you mentioned, not really the easiest to dive at Gragas. Plus, it's keeping Viper wanting to be able to push those minion waves in, make it difficult for Tenacity to show up elsewhere. While bot lane, Value, we had seen just a moment before, had done almost the exact same thing outside of his turret. And Santa Tom Cash does not want to have a lane frozen like that. They need to be able to have the ones frozen towards their own turret so they can rotate around. And that's why Luger is trying to make a play onto Anda to be able to steal some of the chickens. But it might be a spike fight. And I think that actually went over to Kenby. It did. That's a really nice roam there. But Luger now caught by himself. Might be the target if Realm no more gets it. Oh, five fire. Anda, look, it's Anda getting the flash out of Luger. Luger's only level three. Flash bear slap with the bull back in. His first blood coming in from five fire. They did not anticipate that five fire had Realm Warp right there and a great placement to get his jungler into the mid lane. That's going to be a big problem now for Luger, who is off on a mission trying to find some kills, something back for his jungler. But with the wave frozen down here, it's going to be really tricky since the Tom Kench can't really farm by himself. Great Realm Warp here. I really love this good. play and the flash recognition that you're gonna have enough follow up. You got two people flashing in. That's huge. And getting the kill over for Five Fire is even better because now he had to burn his flash, but the kill will keep him safer in the lane with the higher levels and gold score. And 
Then they get the dragon after that. They get the scuttle crab again for Anda. Everything seems to be going no org's way at the moment. They are completely in control, and we're only seven minutes into the game. Luger, whom normally these are the members that we kind of look to to be able to help them out when it comes to these team fights, but this Senna is not going to be rocking and rolling anytime soon. No, not at all. She's going to have to stay in this lane for quite some time, and that will actually give value the option to roam later. We saw in the series yesterday and the day before, I believe it was actually the No Org series, that value was roaming to the mid lane, flash ulting, right? Getting yep. an ultimate onto carries that don't have cleanse. The victor is a prime target here, and you can just constantly trade these summoner spells to get kills. And so when the Cinna gets stuck down there, now you have the option to start playmaking across the map. I think that No Org is in a great position now to start transitioning this advantage and experience. It's going to keep 100 Thieves' bottom lane into the top side where Viper has been doing a fine job in farming and getting that Rift Herald and starting to accelerate the map. I like what they've been doing so far with the Realm Warp. That was what I was looking for when they drafted this composition, and it makes me hopeful to put more resources into Five Fire. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we see in just a little bit time where Five Fire gets that Realm Warp back up and he tries to make another play, this time maybe topside, to be able to get Viper into an excellent position to become a split push threat on this Jace where he can contend against Tenacity and never really let this tank that wants to be a part of the fights to kind of disrupt the backlines ever be able to move. And that's a huge thing. If you can disrupt the backline, you now have much less people willing to body block for the stuns, for the ultimates coming in. But we got cells our altercation here as the there bottom lane for 100 Thieves Ooh, is coming up yeah. here. They're going to get counter ganked. It's going to be the goon squad coming up soon, but can they save Tenacity? They got the pair slap on Tenacity, getting a lot of damage with the fear. And as back inside the alcove, the flash coming in from Tenacity to be able to survive. Viper, unfortunately, nowhere to be able to go. Double kill for Tenby. They didn't even need the bottom lane to be here. Kenvi was already on the way, and he was more than enough. When no org committed to going after the Gragas, it was a huge opportunity for Kenvi to get a two-man ultimate. He already had the Bramble Vest. He was so tanky here. To be able to burst him down was not an option. They hard committed as they had already been on the way. They could have bailed out. Mind you, the flash was available for Jace. There's boots on the Udyr. They could have just left the play, but instead they went for it and they got punished big time because that Rift Herald had their name on it and that belongs to 100 Thieves and this is their ticket back to getting into this game. And with Gragas catching this bottom lane and the Senna in the top side, they're not missing a beat when it comes to CS. And this is something that we highlighted with no, uh, with the side of 100 Thieves, how they can punish teams like Noteworld for a simple mistake, how they look for those little plays. And even though Value was able to get a lot of gold to be able to stay far ahead of Luger and Poom, it's got to come into a little bit more. Try to see if you can get this top lane to be able to help out a bit more. Maybe, again, where you talked about Five Fire with that Realm Warp, now that it's up, get him to be able to take something like a blue buff for free. And you mentioned it's 100 Thieves' ability to punish these mistakes. I think it's their foresight in recognizing what it is that, that no org wanted, what they were looking for as their next objective, and being there faster. Because of the advantage that no org had, they assumed, well, we're going to be able to take this free Rift Herald. We don't need to commit that many resources up here. We don't think 100 Thieves will respond. They are one step ahead. They already have their bottom lane on the way. Their jungler was starting the route that side as well. And so there's so much. It looks so seamlessly when they respond to it, but that's the foresight in recognizing we know what you're looking for, and we're going to make sure that you don't get it. Kenby's in the wings right now, was posturing for a potential dive on the Pfeiffer, but once Big showed his face, he bailed out of that one, said, I'm going to just get my Krugs. It's not worth it. Keep pushing up this lane. Keep winning out as best you can to make sure that we're keeping up with the gold income that Valley's been able to get for himself. And value is going to be critical here to get back to playmaking here. The Varus ultimate is going to be relevant, like we mentioned before, to catching out these individual members. Even the Hecarim is a valuable target because of the rush of the Lucidity boots uh -oh. with these junglers makes it Ooh, really nice easy to catch them. Yeah, good a heads up play there from Viper. There's nothing to indicate that they have not left, right? The atomization, they have no need to base thus far. Their bot lane is off on the map. So even if they were to commit to make a play here, they wouldn't be losing anything on the map. So that's what you have to ask yourself as this laner. If they were there, can my team punish if they actually try to kill me? And just from seeing that your own team is not ready to capitalize on commitment from 100 Thieves should tell you, better play it safe. Well, that's where I want to ask you, because you always have a unique perspective being a former jungler. What would you do if you were uh, on the side of No Org as Anda, who's kind of lost a little bit of that lead over to 100 Thieves, who've now popped the Rift Herald top? 
I'm looking to gank Victor and get my Ryze into the bot lane. I think this is a great way to free up the mid lane and rotate five fire. You gotta ignore the Gragas. He's so tanky at this point, and you're not really matching him with anybody that can kill him unless you put Ryze there. Looks like Value is gonna get jumped, though. He yeah, can 1v1 one one him. That's a lot of damage coming in from Tenacity. He's got that explosive cast, but the TP is gonna scare him away. When are they gonna try to get the damage? They got Viper. There's the explosive cast to try to get away, but the snipe not gonna be in time to be able to save him. It's Value taking the kill and then the turret. Yeah, the Gragas does not have quite that much damage for this. Value with the heal is gonna be able to do enough, so Tenacity commits a little bit too hard for that. And 100 Thieves doesn't even get the Herald to no. take down the turret in the top side. So that is a first brick going over to Noah Org and a kill. I think that Tenacity was a bit over eager there, reaching far too much, thinking that his own team was gonna be able to play make in the top side and that he had an option to get a solo kill on Tavares. But it's that hail of blades damage that is so difficult to anticipate. He's got mixed DPS and he has a level lead on the side of Tenacity. So he's thinking, yeah, I can actually do this. There's a little bit of minion aggro, but it still doesn't matter. Varus, percent HP, Hail of Blades is way too much for a Gragas at this stage. I had thought that he might have been able to do it just because of the Bramble Vest. The Bramble Vest, you can see, it was actually helping out so much in that fight. And Tenacity did do a lot of damage, but like you said, it's just, it's not enough at this point, especially when you're tank. You it's only have the a tank. And the summoner heal. I think the summoner yeah, heal is all, true, often yeah. the one that catches you by surprise. As a laner, as a jungler, trying to go for solo kills. Ooh, nice, nice harass there. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Five fire, I see you. Okay, you gotta respect this rise. Yeah, what? He's thinking, ah, oh, he's, he's nothing. He's not gonna do anything. Just casual kill, casual solo kill. More gold going over to the rise. That was big, though. You can't be feeding rise. That oh. champion is nuts. <gasps> Oh god, that is devastating for 100 Thieves Academy right there. That's two kills now for Five Fire on this roaming mid laner, this rise with Everfrost completed, that he is going to be an absolute terror if he can jump on top of anyone. And if you do not respect the damage from Five Fire, this is going to be no org winning purely through that rise. I think the Monte is going to respect him now. <laughs> I think he's definitely going to keep in mind. Yeah, you you have to. This That was just a, a big blunder there because now it makes it so much harder for the rest of the team to think about how to protect their own jungle when their mid laner is getting pushed back and when the Ryze can do this. Now you really see how easy it could be for Anda or Fifer to just flash onto the Monte and kill him within a single spell. If you just time the Udir stun between the Everfrost and the Rune Prison, he's not getting out. You're getting another solo kill and he might not even burn his flash in the process. I'm glad you brought up that point about Anda because I was literally just about thinking that too. I'm like, you just talked about how it can go, uh, play around getting kills on Victor, but they didn't even need to bring Anda for it. They just have Five Fire being a beast mid lane, and soon, probably now that he's got that Turbo Chem tank in his stock, and is going to be able to make more plays. He doesn't have to just focus on Zamante because they know they're winning the 1v1. And that means that they're also going to be winning the side lanes because of how well Five Fire will be able to rotate with both Teleport and the Realm Warp. And, uh, and Big can be really aggressive. You have the Lantern to bail you out if you want to overstep. And they're holding the wave down here with the J. So it's uh, not the greatest idea to look for these invades just yet with your Jace holding this wave. But once they start shoving out these minion waves, which ideally they'll do within the next minute, so that it will be timed with the dragon. Okay. Uh -oh. the Monte 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 yeah. flashes. Nice, nice. Yeah, you got to flash that. If Five Fire Flash roots you, the hook lands and you're definitely dead. But now you've got that crucial summoner right before the dragon fight. And here okay. goes Anda. Gonna be able to chase in, gets the pull on top of Kenvi, the flay as well. So much damage on top of him, but he's still alive. Needs one more, but there it is. It's gonna be big taking the kill for himself. Beautiful. No org recognizing where their strength lies. You've got so much CC. The Rome squad of Thresh and Udir and Ryze can keep anybody locked down. Doesn't matter if you got Merc Treads. Doesn't matter. They'll be able to catch you to CC you and burst you down before you can escape. Even got the ultimate from Hecarim. Good ever Frost. Good ever Frost. Nice flash, though. Tenacity will be able to survive, but unfortunately for the side of 100 Thieves is that they're losing so much all across the map. The fact that Tenacity had to flash away there and lose the Tier 1 mid lane. No Org have gotten a huge influx of gold, and the majority of it is on the two carries exactly where they want to have it. Three carries, mind you now, because you're playing with a Jace as well, so that's exactly where you want it, like you say. And we're getting a little bit of a similar vibe as to last 
game that 100 Thieves played where EG Academy got those early leads, failed to close, but this time around, the way in which no Org is getting these leads feels a lot more methodical than yesterday. It seems like they actually are having a deliberate plan in getting ahead. They have Dragon stacking in mind. Right now, at least, they're still going for a Rift Herald, but with the way that Five Fire is playing and finding these picks and they're starting to move around him, I get a feeling that they're actually going to be able to push this advantage harder than EG Academy, so 100 Thieves need to start respecting that. The Five Fire a bit far out. He's got a lot of damage with the Everfrost. Double Root to be able to escape. And the Phase Rush, too. It's so tricky to deal with Ryze as a melee champion. I think that's what we have seen as a reason to his to his surgeons, resurgence in the mid lane with Udir and Hecker and Mundo being so prevalent in the meta. Well, all these junglers that just want to run straight at you have a terrible time dealing with a guy that just wants you to run at them and will lock you down, prevent you from moving, and make you a sitting target for all your other carries. For now, 100 Thieves, they're holding on pretty strong at the moment, at least. So, you know, they're not out of this game quite yet. They're still trying to rotate around the map, trying to see, you can see it from their vision, that they haven't fully relented a lot of the control that you'd expect with this kind of deficit at this time. They have it, but I think it's about to get a lot harder, too, because they have been losing these turrets. They haven't lost the top tier one, but between mid tier one and mid tier two being lost before the next dragon fight, that's going to be a tough area to contest to be able to deal with what no org has. You're going to have to group up very tightly and make sure that you don't get picked off by any unsuspecting angles because you're going to have to fight for this dragon. Cloud Dragon is really important here. The Rise with the Realm Warp, the Udir, sorry, the Udir with the Cloud Drake is huge. The Jace as well, even the Varus popping that and being able to move around the team fights better, let alone the passive movement speed that you're getting to be able to avoid the mobility that a champion like Hecarim thrives on. That's the, that's the tough part, isn't it? That you have Hecarim on your team, you see a Cloud Dragon on the other side. You want it, and they want Viper, too. They've got a good amount of damage on him so far. Luger's on the other side, waiting to be able to join in, get himself a little bit of participation in the fight. They've got so much, and Luger will be able to get his first kill of the game. Good recognition by 100 Thieves to see that Viper is way overextended. Just how we had praised him way back in advance, defending the top tier one, backing off, not checking the brushes because his team was not in a position to do anything in response. Here he is once again, but this time failed to recognize that it's only five fire that's pushing the top side. The Thresh, the Varus, and the Deer are nowhere to be found. And while you're going to be able to get this tier one, you don't want to be giving any semblance of gold 200 thieves right now. Their team fight can still wipe you. Right? Their CC is huge. They will be able to scale and be in a strong point and be able to contest despite giving up this dragon if that happens. So you need to make sure that you're not giving any unnecessary gold away. When you're a poke composition and you have a lead, it is easy game. It, all you have to do is just slowly encroach on the territory of 100 Thieves. Keep pushing them out, get vision control. If you see someone that's overextended, you punish them. But even with Viper getting caught down there, him being overextended himself, what did they really lose from it? There's no dragon. They already had the Rift Herald. They got a turret top lane. It's like, even though that kill happens and yeah, it's a little bit of gold, they end up coming out on the be better end of the trade. They do. The turret will help them out in the long run. And now we have to see what 100 Thieves thinks about defending this Baron side because it can be done very quickly. Between the Rise and the Varus, the Udir can tank it. It's a real threat now. So two minutes from now, this Dragon fight, while it is a must fight for 100 Thieves, now they have to think about the fight in itself and not just the objective because winning this fight will now give you the option of going for a Baron. So even if 100 Thieves wins this fight, no org have to think about, well, if they win this fight, they can actually just rush to the Baron. So we must avoid getting completely wiped here. That for, for no org means making sure that you don't even get to a team fight, making sure that you're constantly looking for those picks like we saw them go for Luger. And so the chance that if it goes wrong, doesn't give an objective to 100 Thieves is much higher. There's 100 Thieves still holding on to that 4,000 gold deficit, still trying to see if they can find anyone caught out a little bit too far, but unfortunately for them, no Ark are playing it just how you wanted it, Crumbs. They are playing it smart, 
They're not getting too overextended. They're even trying to see if they can bait in a Baron play from 100 Thieves because they can poke them so heavily. They come anywhere near, waiting for that arrow from Value to connect on a Luger and see how much damage it can do. But instead, it's going to be top lane with Five Fire overextended, getting a lot of damage on Kenvi. But now that he's forced into the alcove, trying to be able to get away with the Realm Warp, he couldn't do so. And a shutdown for Demonte means they have better De Baron defense. It's kind of the same play as we saw towards Viper. You see a solo laner overextended. These champions aren't the most mobile. Mobile, the Rise and the Varus and the Jace Pirate Pardon cannot really escape if you jump them successfully. So they're not even going to be able to get an inhibitor turret in the bottom lane. They just get a spree from Five Fire and it goes over to the Victor. So that was a good pick. It's not going to cost them much since they'll be able to fight this next dragon. At least the vision. They won't have every single ultimate available, and they caught no. Ragus. And Ooh, nice getting splint. bounced around, has the shield from Dawning Shadows. The rest of the cavalry are trying to sh support him, try to show up on the other side. They're able to scare away Anda, but with Tenacity so low, he's not able to be the tank that he needs to for the team. He has to stay so far back, and with one Shock Blast landing onto Luger with the Piercing Arrow onto Poom, they're forced away from trying to see if they can take back control of the jungle. And no Orc doesn't have to commit very hard to this. They've already fended up 100 Thieves. They're going to be able to get this Dragon for free. They used to Teleport from Five Fire just to get him back to the lane to make sure that if there was an opportunity to catch the few members of 100 Thieves, that they would get caught out. That's why you saw Luger burn that heal. The Shock Blast was not enough to burst him. He just needed the movement speed to get out and make sure that Five Fire did not catch him because he still has Flash. He didn't burn it. He's caught by himself. Oh, he can burst him. Oh, man. The Flash Whoa. does not help out. Oh. Oh man, Five Fire, two solo kills this game. Oh wow, the same position too, hiding in that brush, catches somebody that doesn't think that he's there. You needed the Tom Kens to check here, but he didn't have a ward. There's no way to move up there. The Senna is the support, right? She's the one with the wars and division. When she moves up, it was the opportunity for Five Fire. Three spells, bam, you're dead. Now it's gonna be up to Kenby to go for that steal, but Five Fire is on the defense. Fire. He is just making sure to do so much damage over to Poom. Even though no Org are forced off of the Baron, they got Five Fire to go golden, and they've got the pick on the other side. They're going to be able to blow up the Monte so they can try to re-engage on the fight onto Kenvi, onto Tenacity. We're running for the hills. Kenvi's barely alive. Luger's on the other side, but the Flash coming in from Big to be able to get the kill they need to. Well, Tenacity, he's got two on top of him. He's not taking enough to survive, Viper. Fantastic turn from no Org, and it's all spearheaded by Five Fire going after Tom Kench, knows that it's a 1v1. The second the collapse happens, has to Zanya. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I applaud your attempt there. All right. <laughs> big. All right, you got to hook in first. <laughs> yep. They uh, they took the lantern at this, uh, off that. Anyways, great moves by Firefire with the stopwatch to fizzle out the Hecarim ultimate and the rest of the team turning. The call to turn there was crisp. Even though there was a few members on the Baron, the fact that it didn't stay any longer just shows you how well executed it was since not a single member from no org went down. And now they got Baron. They've got this huge lead and we got to take a look at Five Fire constantly the one engaging and making the plays happen. It's, it's a, just a really crucial move there because you have Vision on the side and then on the left side, we miss that, a great hook from Big. Hooking Victor immediately deletes him. He's died every single time with Flash still available. So that shows you that they're playing with Vision really well, catching him out when he's not expecting Whoa. it. Again, Luger dies. We don't know how. He probably well, doesn't fire. either. Just, it just so crazy. much damage. Oh, it's, uh, insane how much he's doing on this rise. And look at this. Two members of 100 Thieves are going the exact wrong way from their base with Baron on top of Viper, Big, and the rest of the goon squad of No Org. They should be able to crack this inhibitor turret. They've come to play here. It's a huge opening statement game from game one. They're looking for Viper again, but there's a lantern here. And unfortunately, did not get the dark charge they needed to. And Kenvi takes so much damage from Viper in the back line of the fight. So he has to charge himself back out of there. All the while, No Org pushing up mid lane, trying to see if they can crack yet another inhibitor turret. While Poom barely survives with thick skin. Ooh, big, very graciously there, leaving Kenvi to live there. Because he had pop box earlier, he would have gone down. This poke is already way too big. The virus and the Jace, another ultimate gets burned. Five Fire is already pushing. Meanwhile, Udir is split pushing. They're getting attacked for three lanes and unable to defend any of them. They can't step up. The moment they try to get anywhere close to no org, they take half 
of their health and damage every single time. That's why they try to see if they can at least get onto Anda, but he's too fast. He's able to just run right on out of there. And even the little bit of damage coming in from Demonte trying to lock him down long enough now that he has no mana with the Chaos Storm. Who are you focusing? An Udyr? Well, your base is getting completely destroyed. Sure, you got the kill, but what's happening to the Nexus turrets? They're gone. Realm Warp to make sure they can finish game one. No Org are here to win. They are not here to play, and they will make sure they do it in a dominating fashion. A great trade that no org will take any day of the week. Kill my jungler for the Nexus, because that was how they ended up that one with a great bait there from Anda. That is a performance. Five Fire just crushed it on that one. Everyone that came to his lane ended up dying, had such a presence, but the rest of the team really played around it. A few shakeups in the side lanes being caught out, but overall, this was a huge game for No Org to really make sure that 100 Thieves rethinks how they're going to take on this team because whatever they tried this game, they need to change it entirely. And I think it kind of goes back to the whole identity of what 100 Thieves had drafted for themselves. They wanted to be able to replicate what they had done yesterday and what had Cloud9 Academy had done on Thursday and being able to survive, scale long enough in the game. But no org, we're never going to let them have that chance. No org are a team that want to play for this early game. Sure, they made a mistake here or there, but that's not enough. Not with this kind of composition where if they get a small smidgen of a lead, they're going to be able to crack the game wide open. And that smidgen was the gank bottom lane that can be attempted. Going level three to gank the bottom lane with the Udir starting topside, the fact that it didn't work out was hugely punished that then translated to Luger going to the mid lane, then it started to snowball from the rise. And so you have to think about how are they playing with this in that time catch because the minion wave was pushed up. They were level two. You're not going to have a lot of kill pressure with these guys. It's a lane that you pick to be safe. So despite the option looking well, the damage that was done was way larger than I think the reward could have possibly been so in the future i'd like to see 100 thieves if they're drafting these kinds of lanes to make sure that they're playing more towards how the lanes want to play the entire game and not just how it looks in the first minute and a half couldn't agree with you more there crumbs but for now we're going to toss it to a break and when we come back the analyst desk with the tigers will break that down so stay around with 5G Ultra Wideband. Wow. The new Samsung Galaxy S21 is on Verizon 5G Ultra Wideband, available in parts of many cities. It's ridiculously fast. Switch and get Samsung Galaxy S21 Plus 5G on us, only on Verizon.
Welcome back to the LCS Proving Grounds presented by Verizon. We have just concluded our first game of the series in which no org pulled out the victory against 100 Thieves Academy. And we got two lovely gentlemen here to break it down, Invert and Cubby joining us once more. I do want to start with the draft though, Invert, because interestingly enough, some picks that are characteristic of no org ended up on the side of 100 TA. Yeah, I mean, Senna Tom Kench is a huge pick uh, for No Org. They are very, very successful on that combination, immediately snatched up by 100 Thieves, but it comes with a price, right? So, for example, 100 Thieves gives No Org the opportunity to fully counterpick their bot lane, right? Puts Luger on a champion that does not play to the strengths that we saw in the last series, and when having counterpick for the top lane doesn't even utilize it to make the matchup volatile so that the Senna and Tom Kench globals can affect that matchup properly. So they they index into their uh, weaknesses or not their strengths as a result because they put Luger on a champion that's not going to be a hyper carry. They put Tenacity on a neutralizer. So now they have two side lanes that don't really do damage or trying to just neutralize their lane or play their lane as, as effectively as they can. And it's really up to uh, mid to do the damage. And we saw that that just was not enough on the side of 100 Thieves Academy. Yeah, and throughout Amateur, one thing that we've seen be very common for Noarg is, I like to say, the kings of Amateur have a kingdom, and that kingdom is blue side. This is their 79th game of the season, 59th game on blue. And if you've watched a lot of those games, they love to full court press. They love to pick three shoving lanes, give Anda a matchup where he can get in the face of the enemy jungler and punish. That's exactly what 100 Thieves gave over to Noorg. And we ended up seeing that come to fruition rather early in this game. So the junglers ending up with some very strong picks there. You're mentioning over on the Noorg side. Inver, what did you make of some of the plays made early by the junglers themselves? Yeah, I thought uh, Kenby sacrificed a lot for his team, which is something that I brought up in the pregame in terms of trying to help his teammates' conditions before he helps himself. So ganks the bot lane, uh, loses a camp as a result, gets double crabbed, and then is able to try to contest the Raptors with Senna moving. However, doesn't happen, gets first blooded, and then no org actually fails to communicate the swap, goes aggressive on topside at the exact moment that they are swapping. And so it just takes this no org advantage, which they generated on the bot side of the map. They don't get to translate it properly into the top side because of the Herald swap, but it is just a snowball effect from the jungle regardless, you know. Anda gets two crabs as a result, gets to farm his second round of camps earlier than Hecarim, and even takes Hecarim's second Krugs, which results in a huge experience lead, huge gold lead, that he gets a carry into the other lanes. And I, I feel those lanes use that effectively, able to build damage to complement the Udyr, and then eventually, as you saw, got to one-shot the Senna or one-shot the Victor as a result of that. Yeah, the one saving grace, if you are a 100 Thieves fan moving forward, is that second clip, the swap that, as you mentioned, Invert, they, they didn't quite communicate that on the side of Norg. That's not just a mistake that we've seen in this game as well. I know specifically game four going up against C9, they call, they didn't call a swap and ended up with Ribbon in a side lane in a three in a 1v3. And when she went back to lane, the Ribbon was level seven against a sign at level nine, right? So this is something that at least 100 Thieves could potentially use uh, to keep on punishing Noorg with these rotations because while we did see Noorg get a lot of really good early leads, we did see them trip over their feet a few times trying to snowball that. Yeah, and the main thing is that Senna cannot take towers and turret plates especially well. So they get the Herald, but they end up matching the turret plates through the Jace TP, right? The Jace gets the TP bot. They are able to go onto the Gragas, who play Tenacity playing aggressive on weak side, and they trade plates uh, pretty evenly. I believe it was four plates for four plates at one point. So, you know, able to recover from that mistake and still allow their carries to build damage to eventually outscale uh, the, the tanks on the side of 100 Thieves Academy and play the map wider, like you mentioned, Cubby, right? Like, Rise plays the map wide, Jace plays the map wide, insofar as they're able to do this 1-3-1 with two tanks in the, in the Udyr and the Thresh, 
and now they're able to play the map wide. The TK is behind, the Senna is behind, can't affect the side lanes as well, and they just don't have damage in their side laners with, with uh, Victor falling behind and, and the Gragas. So they're able to do that full court press, like you mentioned. They're able to slowly develop a lead through gold experience camps, getting the Dragon Soul, uh, eventually getting a Baron as a result as well, and uh, just fairly consistent in that game plan from no org overall. Diving a bit more deeply into some of those small decisions on the side of no org, because this is a best of series. While it was a short game overall in which they had a lot of the dominance invert in the end, there were some moments in the side lanes that continued to be a little questionable. Yeah, full court press. Uh, they're generating uh, numbers advantage as much as they can through mid priority, but sometimes they skip it, right? They saw Senna TK on that uh, side lane uh, in the uh, with a pink in the brush, still get caught. Five Fire gets caught off the TK ulti, doesn't know that TK is 11 probably. Uh, they do end up getting stuff on the other side of the map, but that stuff could be free anyways from the priority they're getting from all three lanes. So able to uh, get objectives off of those deaths, but they can get those objectives without those deaths anyways. So looking to see them clean that up in the series as it progresses. But in honor of looking at the positives of No or Cubby, both yourself and Invert talked a lot about what Five Fire could bring to the table, and he brought some stuff to the table here in game number one. Yeah, what better way to impress your role model than solo bolo him three times uh, throughout the game, <laughs> or get three solo kills throughout the game, right? Five Fire, I love the fact how he was using vision. You saw that ward, and I love that Crumbs brought this up on the cast too, because he got two of them in the same spot where he was utilizing that brush put himself in the fog of war, ended up finding two kills on big carries, really punishing against 100 Thieves. They've lost so much tempo off the play. And while we are pointing out some of the stakes that Norg had snowballing this, it was still a dominant 26-minute victory for the Kings of Amateurs. So the fact that they were able to, you know, win a game that quick despite these mistakes, really concerning for 100 Thieves. And I know that in the next game, they are going for blue side. So I want to see if they have some changes going in because they need to swap up the strategy. Yeah, blue side, that's where 100 Thieves are going. Cubby, you believe they need to swap up the strategy. Invert, quick thoughts on that and what you think they should do. Yeah, just in terms of draft strategy, lean into your strengths, right? Jinx went through the whole draft phase. It was a really key pick in game four of their series yesterday. Want to see crawl Luger. I don't want to see crying Luger. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want to make sure that 100 Thieves index into their strengths so we have a more competitive series on our hands. Yeah, we're all here to see the competition. No Org definitely brought the heat in game number one of this best of five series, and we will continue to watch along to see if 100 Thieves Academy can do the same. We'll see you on the other side of this break.